Uh, hello, Dada. We will begin at six forty. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me, Fresh? Yeah, yeah, yes, sir. Yes. You can hear you. Okay, you can hear yes, me. Sir. I cannot hear you. Uh, uh, am I audible? Wait, let me fix it. Let's put this here, Dada. Oh. Oh, yeah. Now I can hear you. Sure, Dada. Great. Nice to pick my. Okay, how many people we have? Maybe. Hmm. That's a lot of people. Okay. Okay. Let me share this. Oh, wait. I have the link. Actually, let me share the link on my speaker. Sure, that. Yes. In case anybody is interested to them, for some reason. Uh, by the way, like, what's the uh, distribution here? Like, I mean, like, are we do we have people from first year, second year, small second years? Uh, there is there are a couple from third year, and huh. ma majority is from second year. Majority One or second, two yeah. might be from first year who are yet Great. to join. Great. Great. Second year, second year is fine. That's good. Um, Okay. So should we start? Everybody has joined, or should we like wait for two minutes, maybe? One minute. Yeah, we give okay. forty years. One minute. One Somebody minute. do the sixty seconds countdown now. This guy is on clock. So how's life, man? How's the AC? Uh, well, uh, till one and a half month ago, it was fine. And I mean, for internship, we are out for internship now. Okay. I mean, like you said, like, till one month ago, AC was fine. Now it's not. I mean, like, what happened? <laughs> uh, yeah. My promise is a bit outdated, too. Uh, so the worst can really happen. So firstly, I guess uh, one of our members will give a brief intro about you, Vika. We will start. Vika, I think the newer students who haven't yet known, always doesn't have even been known about you. Vika, would you please start now? Yes. According to Alfred Aho, computer science is a science of abstraction, creating the right model for a problem and devising the appropriate mechanizable techniques to solve it. Good evening to everyone. I'm Bigga Bora from AC Coding Club and with me I have Miganka Da as my co-host and we, we welcome you all. Today engineers rely on computers for much of the processes. Using computers and especially computer software, engineers can design, taste and make changes to products in minimal time. In view of this, we, the Assam Engineering College, Coding Club, in collaboration with GDSE AEC, is going to organize a seminar on scaling CS fundamentals to real world and the missing bits today. In this program, our guest of honor is Rajatkani Bhattacharji Dada, an ex alumni of Assam Engineering College. Again, every warm welcome, Dada. Thank you so much for giving your valuable time. First of all, I would like to give a brief introduction about him. Rajatda did his BE from our renowned Assam Engineering College in the year 2019 by securing first rank in the Computer Science and Engineering Department and second rank in the University. He also secured third position in All India Level Competition Ideaton organized in IIT Delhi. He was also the ex secretary of AC Coding Club in the session 2017 to 2018. His publications were Heldung Design Generation Using Generative Networks, a framework for maintaining citizenship records on blockchain, a secured land registration framework on blockchain. He has done his internships from Indian Institute of Technology, Gandhi Nagar, Indian Institute of Technology, Gohati, Indian Institute of Information Technology, Gohati, etc. He has a lot of experience as a software engineer in different companies like Gojek, Taipito, etc. Currently, he is working as a software engineer in the ShareChat. 
He was also project engineer in Assam Engineering College. The project title was Object Motion Detection Framework. Now, uh, I would like to mention some agendas of our club. These are mainly to make some stuff about need for inculcating coding habits and industry skills in the students, forming a group where students learn from each other. And we are trying to connect students to which alumni with industrial experiences and so on. Thank you. That's all from my side. Yeah. Wait, Ragambo, is he saying something? Ragambo, you are on mute. Uh, Ragambo, unmute yourself. Ragambo, I can't. You might have some issue on this technical thing. Uh, yes. uh, Am I audible this time? Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. So I was saying that thank you, Rajada, for taking the, being able to take the time out of your busy schedule to be among us and guide the juniors. Also, before moving on to the great presentation, I want to ask you one thing personally. Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, Rajanko, your voice is breaking. Your voice is breaking, so I couldn't get you. Should we start or like? Uh, basically, he was thanking you for let me be okay. missed it. So thank you, Dada, for coming with us on, the, on such short process and also out of his big schedule. Your sessions have always been inspiring. In first year, we attended your session. It was a big booster to us. We hope our juniors also got a similar vibe from this session. So I guess you can take over. Yeah, yeah let's hope. Uh, okay, should we share my screen? Uh, Have everybody seen my screen? It's visible. Oh, okay, great. Somebody just keep talking to me because otherwise, like, I'm not able to see this particular screen, right? It's always this one. Okay, let me give me a Let's start. Okay. So today, uh, as like we all know, we'll be talking about CS fundamentals and how do they really scale the real world. Before that, like we, we already got a like really long introduction of me. Uh, I mean, like I'll just condense it down for you for now. I am a software engineer, right? Uh, currently working at ShareChat, and I just joined ShareChat two days back. So yeah, I, uh, the last week I was working with Project. Um, in my short duration of like, and three years is a very short duration of working as an engineer. I have actually searched to many different places. I always keep pursuing the problems that uh, that interest me. If it doesn't, I leave. Uh, apart from that, uh, I really like computer science in general. So, which means like I am somewhat like most people would call this as polyglot way of doing things. I don't like to call that because polyglot is a lot more than what people think it is. I mean, the last uh, known for in polymath is what you call is it like someone who's good at in all different things is was John von Neumann so definitely not that <laughs> yeah so I try to do a lot of things whatever interests me uh, you can connect with me over LinkedIn that's my ID and that's my Twitter Twitter ID and don't ask me why I named it simple guy I just like it yeah. okay uh, disclaimer I just prepared them an hour back so they were typos not that if I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have made the typos. I would make the typos anyway. This is uh, completely personal. Like, I mean, these, all the opinions that you have are completely personal. And yeah, uh, you should be aware of it. Uh, most of my experiences and the instances that I will share are pretty much real. But I'm not sure whether the companies are alive or not. Like alive or sold out. I have yeah, no idea about this. So what are we going to talk about today? OK, so first we'll start with some of like a uh, minor small simple problems that i solved and came across and that might give most of the people here some clue on to what are really relevant uh, in your course right and this is again like very specific to uh, your course structure like my entire uh, all the slides will like whatever i show you 
I'll, I'll tell you that what the, what part of your course should you really focus on so that you can get a better understanding. So it's completely fine if you do not understand it right now, but know that that whatever I'm telling you, you can easily Google them. And then whatever concept I tell you, you can always find them in your own course. So this is the entire like the uh, you know the top point of today's like you know discussion and like interaction is that I want you guys to understand that how the CS fundamentals uh, play their role in everyday uh, you know uh, an engineer's life. Right. So first we go to the uh, tiny problems. Then I'll also talk something about from my recent experience and talk about in general how can you have systems understanding and yeah like if there is more so yeah that's it great so is there a thing just do share it also right. i don't mind okay okay and start. so problems from past that is like uh, in my early days what kind of problems i came across and you know sort of realizations that i got. And not just realization, I kind of knew that, but that was like the first instance that I saw this. So this is the one, right? On the left, you are looking at a standard geeks for geeks problem. Minimum number of platform required for a railway slash bus station. I really would like if everybody could just Google this problem, right? You will probably find this on geeks for geeks very quickly. Uh, Prash, it would be great if you can actually share the link, maybe, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. And below you can see is a video editor. And I actually am using the video editor on which I work on. But most video editors, if you have worked with one, will have this timeline view, right? You can see these capsules, right, being laid down. So the question is, the minimum number of uh, platform problem, and this, the way this layout works, are they any different? So. Uh, I would like to everyone to just go through the problem first. Uh, let me just share it and let me know that uh, if it makes sense. I mean, yeah, are you able to read? Is everybody able to read this uh, particular uh, statements or is the font too small? Because in that case, Koyash can uh, share with the link. It's readable. There. I also okay. have shared okay. it. Okay, great. So go through it and let me know that whether this problem and this particular UI element, when you see a bunch of capsules being laid on top of each other, are they really different? Because like I can obviously give you the reveal there, but I want you guys to at least think about it once. Uh, take your time, uh, maybe like one minute, two minutes. Or uh, probably people will be tapping about in the chat. Okay. So I'll just present and give you the spoiler for the answer. The answer is yes, they both are same. As a matter of fact, uh, whenever we are actually creating this UI element, right? This UI where we actually lay down each of these capsules. So these capsules are basically thinking about that there might be probably an uh, like in Photoshop, you can add a bunch of images together. You can add uh, maybe an After Effects. You can use uh, put together a bunch of videos. So these are actually that. Right? They are actually determining when does the image start showing and when does it stops. That's it. That's that's just a visual cue. Now the thing is, we need to figure out. For example, if I have ten such kind of elements, right? Uh, what is the maximum uh, height or the maximum, you know, tracks do I need to really create to accommodate all of these uh, uh, elements, right? And the data, the way it is available is exactly like this. You have a beginning, right? A beginning time of the uh, capsule and an ending time of the capsule. And then you just figure out like how many tracks do you need? Or in this case, how many slots do you need? Right, and turns out uh, the uh, the uh, actual implementation, even currently in the software, is not the optimal answer. It's the n square one. So bummer, right? The the optimal answer is of uh, n log n complexity. I hope like everybody is getting uh, it because the complexity is something that uh, you get introduced in second year itself, and like from what I understand, most of you are from second or third year or from, from first year. So yeah, I guess you might get the idea that. Uh, the optimal answer for this comes in uh, O of n log n, the most complex. 
And the answer, <laughs> the, um, the implementation we were using was O of n square. Now, I'm not talking about in terms of uh, optimization, but think of like this, is that these, uh, this particular problem, this came out of nowhere, right? Like we just saw that, okay, we need to do this kind of layout. But the answer laid in completely something different, right? And it was something in a fundamental subject that you study in, you know, just your second or first year. Right. I think in AC is still in second year because you get the basic engineering courses in first year. So yeah, it's you probably study this in second year itself. So see that? Like, I mean, if you study it properly back then, if you you know get a good understanding of uh, algorithmic complexities, um, so basic sorting mechanisms, and you know, just in general have a good sense of problem solving, I mean, you would not write the O of N square in the first row. And you would be better equipped to actually spot these problems. So whenever you see some problem, right, like some uh, kind of such kind of requirement comes up and then you see like the algorithms, I won't say the algorithms would put like, immediately pop up, but you would be very good at identifying what should be really the complexity for it. You might not be able to figure out immediately, but you would be really get good at uh, figuring out the complexity. And when you figure out the complexity, right, you really, you already start to guess about what you can throw at it. So whether you can throw a hash map or a sort sorting algorithm or a tree or whatever like you you know what to throw because you know the complexity for it so yeah that's why like algorithms are important they are fundamental do not skip do not ignore even if you are thinking that name uh, front end and i just want to do front end like this is a front end we're looking at the front end so yeah you're welcome on that. next thing data structures uh so data structures uh again comes up the, like there are some basic data structures like hash map tree uh, I won't consider array as a data structure exactly, but yeah, uh, hash map and tree being the most popular one, link list. So these things are common and ideally you should pick them up. Now this is an example of uh, where do you, will you really see them when you're actually practically working with something that generally people don't relate with data structures. So in the bottom right, this is how react, right? Works on your DOM nodes. So for people who do not have context about DOM nodes, when you see an HTML, right, you write a bunch of tags, h1, h2, um, give me some other name, yeah. h1, h2, then uh, the header, then body. So these are all tags, right? Now if you think about it, if a1 is the body, b1 can the h, b1 can be the h1, b2 can be the, uh, the paragraph, right? b3 can be another item inside it. So effectively it's a tree. What React does is that convert it into a list and then iterate on it. And turns out this is also a geeks for geeks question. So again, like the same idea, like you cannot really escape data structures. You might not always require to write this again, unless you're working with the React team, but you will have to know like these fundamentals will scale and be like sticking with you wherever you go. In whatever cases, like I'm, I'm particularly showing for the front end because people generally think on front end these things are not present, right? So I don't know why they, why people think that, but yes, uh, probably because of the interviews. We'll talk about that as well. But I guess it, this is quite clear, right? That uh, data structures are important, algorithms are important, and data structures and algorithms are not just important for cracking the interview, but beyond that as well, right? That's why I'm showing these examples so that you guys get the notion that it's not just about the interviews. And yeah, oh, we I missed that thing. <laughs> okay. And uh, there is more. So I'll share the link for this. Wait, let me see if I can share it. Yeah, I hope everybody got the link. Yeah. Okay. There's more to these kind of stuff. Like I was actually about to talk about hash tables, but I don't think I should go much deeper into it. Like considering that we want to include it as well. And I really want to have it, uh, more interaction with uh, everyone here so that I can entertain their questions. But uh, if you have used any programming language, like uh, like something like Python or JavaScript, JavaScript is quite popular. So you might have used something like object, right? Or dictionary in Python. Uh, they generally are treated as a hash table whenever you're using it. So this is just an article I'm giving uh, in the link, like uh, the one that I've given. So this analysis is a link to it. 
you can actually read about how they are like uh, how these various languages are implementing it internally now it might not be always important to know but again coming back to the earlier point right you won't be implementing a hash map but it's good to know as a matter of fact when you're using a language it's really good to know to that how that language behaves and implements implements a lot of the things that you are using right because in the end of the day you are going to use an api what's more important and what many of the junior actually miss, junior engineers misses out on is that they do not care about what's uh, underlying the api they just look at the library look up for it oh i'm going to solve this is there an api library you import it in and problem solved good that is efficient actually but if you don't know what your library is doing inside of it, you don't know which one's the best one here. We're going to talk about this, uh, like the academy of choices, like which libraries to for, for, uh, pick up and all later, uh, like in the QA section. But right now, this I want everybody uh, to understand this, that you need to dig deeper in general. And if you want to dig deeper in your software career, like if you want to progress, you have to dig deeper. And in order to dig deeper, you need to know algorithms and data structures. Hence, what I've want to convey in the end is that it's not just about interviews so yeah but yes uh, you'll still require them for interviews that's like you need them okay uh now i'm going to talk about things that i faced more recently right uh that's basically me as a systems engineer and for anyone who's wondering like well okay uh we're talking like i am trying to work in a software engineer then why i'm using the systems engineer term here when I say systems engineer, it generally mean uh, I was not working on an application. So previously, the one that I showed, right? Uh, these are applications. So this is a video editing application. Your mobile has a bunch of applications. So at one point, I was working as an app, uh, application engineer, is what you can say. But uh, recently, uh, like <clears throat> around April when I searched, I was working as a systems engineer. So I was working more on the system side of problems. When I say systems, I mean my daily work involved looking at some kind of uh, problem which always got resolved by my understanding of what the operating system was doing uh, what the how the software was interacting with the operating system or the network uh, topology or the architecture of like which cpu we are using so and so forth right so that systems understanding came into picture like comes into picture when you are acting as a systems engineer Right? You, your title might be software engineer, but you might be acting as a systems engineer as well. Right? So that's why I use the term systems engineer. And that is basically how systems engineer really looks like. You're just looking at them, staring at a screen, doing nothing. They're actually doing something, but on surface, that's how they look like. Okay. So this is where like, I mean, uh, things, uh, <clears throat> uh, things might go out of context for a lot of people here. So I want to first actually just get a confirmation on how many people have word heard the word or heard about the software called Kafka? Like, I mean, how many people, how many of you guys have really heard? Like, if you have heard about, you can just like ping yes or yeah, have heard, have worked, something like yeah, that would be great if you can do that. There are like 47 people here. It would be great if we can. And that is completely fine if you say no, because this is something that uh, like a second year student is not expected to know about it. Okay, so I'm guessing like not a lot of uh, not a lot of people have really heard about it, but you can always uh, Google about it. What Kafka does? Uh, how many of you have really uh, heard about message queues? Uh, uh, any kind of message queue? Have any one of you worked with them? Okay, uh, I'll just give you a <clears throat> primer on the message queues. So message queues are basically, I mean, if I have to simplify, as a matter of fact, I'll, I'll, I'll actually simplify this. At my previous job, I was working with the events platform team. And if I have to give you a rudimentary understanding of what an events platform team was, it was the Indian Post Office Association or organization. Yes, like we are the, like the post office association. Kafka here was the truck or the transportation medium. Right. And basically everyone's application. So someone's writing something in Node.js, someone's writing something on uh, some other uh, <clears throat> uh, language and they want to communicate to each other. So the Node.js application wants to tell the Golang application sitting in Taiwan that, hey, something has happened. Right. So it wants to send a message or a telegram in the post office term, the terminology, a telegram. And we 
as like the post office association we are like theek hai bejo we have the trucking system we have the communication system laid down for you you just need to make sure like you're delivering it to the right post box so that it gets picked up and get delivered to the right place and that's uh, this, this entire delivery thing in like in general software systems is handled by a message queue and that's what it is a message queue the the guarantees are that if the message is given it will pro it will reach okay you when later you guys get introduced to more advanced concepts like distributed systems and distributed processing you will even realize about the that guarantee of that uh, message bheja to message milega is very hard to achieve it's not that easy right but kafka is one of those things that constitute as the truck for the indian post association <laughs> that uh, it was basically the uh, that transport system for us now here's the thing a lot of people use kafka right i mean after for example you graduate you go into software engineering there is a high chance you will come across it if you are working in a uh, organization it's even like you know uh, that has a user base above uh, an active user base above uh, 100000 right uh, 100000 in a day chances are you are going to have kafka because by the time you might have already started to go into microservices right i won't talk about microservices exactly here but to put it simply you have one node application you have one golang application they just want to communicate to each other why you are doing that because your team is much more larger and for example you might know something i might know some like you might know one language and i might not know that language so i want to write in the language that i know so to enable all the teams generally applications might be written in different language so kafka comes into that context then. and chances are a lot of you are going to use it and here's the thing a lot of people do use kafka but they don't know what it does internally right and what it does is very fascinating uh, is <clears throat> first of all then how many of you uh, have an idea that how slow disk are i hope a lot of people uh, okay are in the mobile is it socket.io so socket.io is a package right it's a package that's achieving a few things is that it's trying to use the web socket port, uh, protocol and if cannot do that it will fall back and still give you the same uh, end to end connectivity uh, with the server which is like both uh, end to end connectivity as in like uh, duplex connection so you can send message from the client and also get it from the server as well so it's not socket.io but you can think of it like uh, like kind of a single server sitting and exposing a socket.io uh, connection you can think of it like that so that uh, that single server becomes the broker it becomes you know the arbiter between so uh, one server and the second server and basically communicating between these two like servers that's it so kafka actually effectively is that i know like this might actually go beyond that but i'll uh, like yeah so my question was actually uh, how many of you really like have a idea of how slow disk are hard disk in general are can you give me a you know a ball can anyone give me a ballpark figure that how much time does it takes to uh read from this and get a data back to the memory does anyone have idea about it or uh if i give you that uh, which one is slower memory cache this what will you say uh it's an open question by the way uh in the three what do you guys think like which one is the slowest one disk okay correct that's fine it stays faster that's all i know okay good okay this memory cache ha huh. that that's uh, yeah that is effect that that's correct watch that's thanks on that one so disk is slow right i mean uh cache is fast memory is faster but disk is the slowest one and to give you a scale cache accesses are generally under 1 to 10 nanoseconds uh memory accesses generally go till 100 to 200 or sometimes like 500 nanoseconds this accesses can go till milliseconds i mean at worst case right they can be they can get really slow and and these are numbers from the older edge uh, hard disk these days ssds are much more faster as uh, one pointed out that ssds are faster which is correct but still ssds are slower than memory uh, like e or ram that is your memory but kafka does something uh, you know, awesome awesome is that 
despite doing a uh, write to disk it is not slow right it's writing to disk and yet it's one of the most fastest message broker out there i mean if you're writing to disk right you should be slow because we already like have it and it's actually doing a blocking io so uh, blocking io mean is that you get a request and then you write it and then you let the other person know so person a sends you a message you write it onto your disk and then send it to person b or application b so that blocking io like we already you know, uh, know that the disk is slow so how is the communication really fast and here's the thing that when i asked about the question that whether the disk is slow i did not ask is for what kind of writes and this is something that you're going to come across in your operating system classes is that uh, disk management is a big thing is a big part of how uh, operating system generally uh, <clears throat> hides away the uh, hides away the complexities of uh, of a disk access right you generally don't care that what kind of disk you are accessing and at what rate you are accessing what are the you know interfaces and the problems that are associated with it or uh, in general uh, is you just expect that it is slow but you don't realize that whether it's actually trying to optimize it this is a good example of it is that when we say disk is slow we are actually talking about random reads or random writes Ra doing something randomly on disk will always be slower right but if you try to do sequentially then it's not so what i mean by sequential is that you have a uh, disk drive right you have that cd drive like i'm talking about hard drive here you start from point a and then it keeps rotating right so if you sequentially right it will just rotate but if it is random it's not just rotating it's going zigzag from point a to point b throughout the entire disk which is much more slower and it's a very fundamental concept that like you you'll read in your operating system book and might even forget but the thing is it is something that's widely used and it like <clears throat> comes under the underlying fundamentals of why kafka is pretty fast despite writing things on disk and the reason it writes on disk is for recovery because disks are resilient right okay uh the next point is uh okay how many of you have your operating system classes by now uh, put out of the context how does file systems impact the disk right see crash it'd be great if you actually ask the question like other because i'm not really uh ask the question as in, as in like verbally yeah it, because so i cannot I, uh, like i'm not always reading it right and i don't think a lot of people are reading it as well so i actually did not interrupt while you while you were speaking that's fine do interrupt please otherwise yeah it will be better sure yeah. yeah you are asking awesome. i didn't read the question at all okay so basically today recently i realized this i am currently on a butter fs based system so uh, how does spins the file system generally impact or has the impact on the disk write speeds so means i heard at butter fs they did something that the write speeds are faster but it sometimes it may take long time while deleting so hmm. this is something i recently encountered but i haven't gotten much into it so i want to tell you correct actually file systems do impact mm -hmm. greatly so like any specific uh, thing you want to know like... uh, what this means uh, the layer actually how does the file system layer the means interacts with the thing a little bit okay okay so uh, the file system layer like effectively is actually a data structure it's just a big ass data structure of just telling how many sectors we have and how many segments we have i mean this might this definition will change for an ssd because ssds are laid out differently but that's what uh, like effectively a file uh, system does like it, it it keeps a track record of these and the the way that it keeps a track record of these will like comprise a lot of how the underlying uh, you know the disk is used so think of it like this okay i'll actually give you a real life example so Red Dead Redemption. If anybody of you know, it's a massive game, right? It's a 150 or like 132 GB game, right? Now, do you think that the entire 132 GB is sequentially after one after each sector? So, it, so a disk, right, generally has a segment and sectors, right? And so, it's not that they, it, all of them will be laid out one after another. But here's the thing: if the file system is capable enough. to actually really achieve that by identifying that yes 
we need to fix the holes so we need to uh, fix the fragmentation and that's what we, like i was coming to it, it, if we can identify that uh, it, uh, that fragmentation needs to be fixed and the files for red dead redemption needs to be laid after one after another like as close as possible then you're going to get really good experience when you're playing they will have no stutters ever i mean if your disk is fast enough so that's how the file system really impacts i mean certain file systems are good for certain kind of hardware right because those hardware have different kind of read write latencies so your uh, <clears throat> file system access patterns sorry your file system data structure might also depend on that so this is something you will actually come across in your operating system class and that was actually my question that uh, how many of you guys have already come across your operating system classes uh guys anyone uh again i'll just repeat the question uh, how many of you guys have come up, like already done your office system classes or have come across uh your office system classes? Yeah. uh not yet okay oh okay okay great uh Actually, you know what? Uh, I'll give you a primer on that. So um, here's a good, uh, here's a question for you guys. In Intel i3, right, with four core versus Intel i7, eight cores. Actually, that's an old data. These days, it's like much more better. It's like 16 cores or 10 cores or 12 cores. Yeah. But let's take these as an example. i3 four core versus i7 eight cores. Which one will be faster? Simple question. I7 8 cores. I7 8 cores. Okay. That would be a fair, correct assumption. Right? And depending on the type of program, does it utilize multi threading or not? That is correct as well. And we are actually about to talk about that. Only. So, uh, in front of you, you are actually looking at two different programs. One is, like, as a brash group, is that while it's trying to utilize threads, Right. The other one is also tied to utilize threads. We're going to talk about that, how you should not really utilize threads. So this is, uh, so you can see uh, this one, right? Okay. I hope everyone can see that. So on your left side, you have consume parallelly, right? We are, and consume parallelly actually takes an ARR, uh, an array, and okay, I actually wrote it wrong. It should they have taken the array, but just assume it's getting the array. Hmm. I've made the mistake. Never mind. Yeah. And you're actually giving the beginning and the ending uh, index for it. So you have a big ass array and you're basically taking chunks of it to uh, consume and do something parallel. This is actually Golang for anyone uh, who don't know about the language. When you do a Go and some function name, it's going to spawn a separate thread and run it, right? We're doing the same thing on the right hand side as well. The only difference is that this time you are actually copying the array, right? And as uh, someone pointed out that i7 is faster, correct. i7 will be faster versus an i3. But if the i3 is uh, running the right, uh, the, the code on the right side, it might just be more faster. I mean, it might give better latency numbers. Might, because again, we just have four uh, items here, right? So that uh, uh, eight cores is not getting well utilized, right? So that I3 might win. And here's the reason for it. And this is like, so that's why I quoted that your OS class is in action. Is that what's happening here is that you're hinting to the, uh, op, uh, to the compiler, uh, <clears throat> compiler and also like the compiler, whatever it code it uh, compiles onto, it will also try to achieve this. And your, again, your operating system and in general, your system will try to achieve this. Is that you see the copied array would lay in the cache of the individual th course. And you see, we discussed it a while back, right? That caches are fast. They're they are bloody fast. One nanosecond is pretty fast or even less than that, right? And if you get direct access to, you know, like if each thread gets direct access to those caches, so think about it, how fast it will quickly churn through all the data. On the other hand, if you look at the left-hand one, this array is 100 right it can totally happen that it is not able to you know reside in the same 
uh, cache, right? So it might be even moved to the memory, right? That's the worst case. And at best case, it might just still lay in the L2 cache because L1 caches are very small, right? So it lays in the L2 cache. Now, I hope everybody has heard about L1, L2, L3, these kind of caches uh, schemas. If you're not, please read about it. They're very interesting stuff too. So, so yes. Uh, so the point being that effectively the data lays in a slow space. The, the, the space itself is slow. So any processor trying to access the data will have a hard time reaching to it, a hard time getting it back. So how can you have a really uh, fast execution there, despite the fact you have multiple threads, right? So the cache, the idea of cache locality is somewhere getting broken. So that's your OS, you know, effectively OS uh, classes would actually talk about these as well. We, uh, what we call as a memory management, uh, the entire section is called as memory management. So we'll see that how from cache to uh, uh, <clears throat> this uh, memory layout mappings happen and then how does that goes into virtual memory mapping uh, <clears throat> and that is what the operating systems are using. So again, these things are very interesting. Uh, like if you, like you know pay heat to those classes and you can actually easily you know explain this and here's it like really uh, uh, i mean honest truth not a lot of people can reason about it it's, it's pretty basic but not a lot of people can if you do that really it will help you down the line writing good software in general right and it's like it will help you uh not just like writing software in general it it will also you know give you a good perspective towards reading others and you know not just others, but like code for, uh, you know, softwares which really, you know, try to churn out the most amount of performance for the machine, right? So again, like never do not ignore your OS classes. That was the point, right? So this, this, these are things that you will come across in your OS classes. So those CS fundamentals are not exactly useless. Uh, this one doesn't have a separate slide. Uh, but how many of you, so I hope that this might actually be something that I can, we can interact about. How many of you use Node.js? Uh, I guess someone of you have definitely tried or used Node.js. That yes. Please tell me a lot of people have used Node.js. It's like pretty easy platform to work with. Okay, great. Uh, uh, Arindam, Prayash, like you guys have heard of the idea that Node.js is single threaded. Uh, that's uh, actually a question, by the way. Uh, have you guys heard of that? I have used Node.js, but I have never encountered such. Okay, good. So, like, as more, like, more you keep using it, right, you will realize, like, and this is a common trope that people will even criticize Node for, that Node has just, like, one single thing, like, the program, your program, whatever you write, right, the JavaScript program, it will effectively just uh, use one single thread of that i7 machine to run your code, right? So that eight other seven cores are sitting ID. I mean, this is just on a high level. Uh, how many of you have used uh, Redis? Have any of you Redis? It's a very popular cache. Okay. Um, so uh, I'll just explain quickly. So Redis is the cache implementation. So when I say cache implementation, uh, to think about like this, if you have a database, right, with close to 15 million entries, and all you want to do is just grab some user data, right? Uh, or maybe it's, uh, maybe some kind of query you have written, some kind of SQL statements you have written, you know, to grab some data out of that database. You don't always want to reach out to the database because it's a slow access. We already discussed that this is slow. So why not create a memory pool, a, you know, a, a, a basically a sector in the memory or a machine which has, you know, a lot of memory in it, a lot of RAM, and then just put that data there. And whenever required, and whenever we know it's the same query, we just access that me memory pool. That's effectively what cache is, right? Now, uh, as for Redis, like, I mean, hope cache, I'm able to communicate cache really well, like, yeah. But as for uh, Redis, Redis is a very popular and very scalable cache, and that as well is single threaded, right? Um, and the answer for how do they really scale is Node largely does IO bounded workload. So almost every server does that, right? And Redis 
uh, completely leverages the idea of cache locality and zero contention, uh, which wins over multi-threaded architecture. I know like this might, you know, go overhead for uh, some people because like I feel like a lot of people, a lot of you guys have not been really introduced to these concepts uh, as of yet. But uh, to put it simply, uh, when I say cache locality, what we discussed a moment back is that that if your code and your data lays in the cache, it's going to be the fastest running code in your entire machine. Zero contention means here is that if you have two cores, trying to grab data uh, onto the same memory space you are going to have a you know condition where you basically like two people are running for the same cake like cake ka last piece baki hai pizza ka last piece baki hai and do log uske liye bhag rahe hain so you have that condition there and, and contention never helps because two people will be querying ki mere ko chahiye cake mere ko chahiye pizza and like two people are just querying nobody is getting it <laughs> so it's just time wasted so that's contention. If you have the single thread, like if you just have one guy in the room and just one pizza and the last piece, you just go and grab it. That's it. And the next guy who comes in, he's like, pizza nahi hai. So like, hai, pizza ke liye wait kare. But there will be no contention. There will be no, you know, two guys squaring and you like everybody is like looking at it like, why you do that? Like, so that's what like zero content, the idea of zero contention means. Two ports will not fight for the data, will not try to get a lock onto the data. Just one core trying to get the data. And if that data is in the cache, good, great. That's the fastest you can do. And that's what Redis is about. Same thing IO. And all the things that I'm talking about, right? Again, comes up, is going to come up in your operating system and partly in your computer architecture classes. Question is, do you need them? Yes. These are things that are used daily, like almost every day. And the uh, bad part is that not everybody can really reason about these. It's very difficult to uh, like sometimes to even work with people who cannot re uh, reason about this because they sometimes end up creating very overly complicated solutions sometimes, right? And that hampers, you know, uh, the you know the team, the software in general in the long term. It does hampers. So these kind of reasoning again really helps. So if you focus your operating system and computer architecture class. That will always help you in the long run. Yeah, I actually was about to talk about these as well, but yeah, there are just more terms you're going to come across. And like these are the kind of terms that you will ask here. Like normal forms, uh, boy scott normal form. Uh, yeah, this IEEE 785. Right? I, like I don't know IEEE 785 to be honest. Like I forget IEEE 785, I suspect basically. But I understand what, what the impact of it. But yeah, I myself forget the spec all the time. So yeah, you don't have to remember the spec. It's on Google. And the point being that uh, are these useful? The answer is uh, yes. I mean, you these are like the formal tools for you to think. So when you read about them, or or, or when your uh, class or your class material covers these, make sure to uh, pay attention. Why? Because the thing is, these are the tools for thought. These are how you think about problems. All these things. Again, your thought process is correct. You're utilizing the system properly. You're thinking about the problem in terms of a computer hardware. Like generally, you will always hear that uh, business application or the business logic or what the you know, software does is much different from what the hardware is trying to do and it's the the abstraction layer should be maintained this should always be there right it's like for example if you are using instagram like instagram na tum photos upload karo, that should not be a factor in any way whether you're doing it on an iphone or whether you're doing it on an android but we all know that it is a factor right iphone might be more snappy and like my android like my phone is a little bit older so it's crappy so it does it much more slower so is this a factor Right. And the same factor needs to be considered when you're developing a software. So it's not really, you know, completely adjunct and divided that they make a business logic. Now let's achieve business goals. So it doesn't work that way. Exactly. And if you're trying to do that, you'll write crappy software in general. That's like, there's no, there's no alternative to it. Great. Uh, yeah. And lastly, this, I mean, system concepts, like this is just like a takeaway. If you guys want to take note, like whenever you are uh like going through your operating system and computer lessons make sure that you have a good understanding of threads disk writes memory management 
scheduling that's something i did not talk about it well but i guess you guys will anyway come across it basic network principles okay and yeah these are very heavily and often used concepts so yeah and then you will come across more topics like compilers linear algebra i just like <laughs> put a random term there from formal automata i don't how many of you have come across formal automata at this point fresh like uh, it's, it's, it's in second year right uh, actually i guess not that uh, i am I'm of ET uh, in electronics. So. Oh, yo, okay, 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 great. I actually I, thought that you guys want CAC. So, anyway, like, this is actually CAC, folks. Uh, Chomsky hierarchy is just like another meme that you will come across. Pretty annoying, by the way. Uh, and yeah, Turing machines. That's like, I think Turing machine, everybody has heard about it for some reason. So, yeah, whatever the hell Turing machine is. I know. But, yeah. Again, do we need to know about it? The same, the same idea, right? It's good to know. It's not necessary. These things are good to know in, for, for general software engineering roles, unless and until uh, your role specifically requires it. For example, my role these days requires me to know linear algebra, but definitely it does, it does not require me to know compilers. Right? Uh, but linear algebra is something, uh, is a like, you know, need of the time for me. So, yeah. And it's good to know because that expands your horizon. That also expands your horizon of how you think about problems and how you solve them. And the greater the horizon that you have, the more flexibility you have, you will have in terms of how you operate, which is a really nice thing to have. Not that you're in, not that the industry will really entertain that, but yeah. Yeah, I'll actually stop for now and I have some like uh, just two, two more slides. Yeah. Uh, but yes, I want to really interact with you guys right now. I'll stop sharing and yes, all questions are welcome. I've been talking for a long time, man. Ooh. Okay. Okay. Uh, questions. Everybody can either turn on their mic. No need to turn on their camera if they are. I don't know. Camera genic. Or photogenic is it? Whatever. Or non photogenic. Uh, okay. There are a lot of people leaving the That's good. Yeah, I mean, that's time for like Q&A. Like, I mean, just taking a break. You guys can ask your questions. I'm just waiting on the questions, by the way. Like, any questions you guys have, anything. I mean, not specific to the stuff that I was talking about because the point there was to really just guys, just you guys, let, have you guys motivated about the subjects more than the externalities and number of things that you generally hear, like people talking about machine learning, web development, this, that, planar, hinda, what not else. Right. I was just trying to like, you know, get you guys to focus again on your fundamentals so that you don't miss out on that. Yeah. Um, so questions. So that I had a question. Yeah. Uh, that are from our course, whatever we learn, how do we get into data science or something like that? Okay. Oh, uh, how do you get into data science? So again, uh, that linear algebra thing, right? So you have your maths courses right like you you have your basic math being covered out right in the in the near i think second year itself you have probability and statistics make sure that you pay attention to that like i mean no need to pay attention to the teacher if you don't want but you can always study it on your own there is that uh linear algebra like if you're in computer science you're going to again come across it uh in one machine learning course at the end of uh your in, in your fourth year and as well as uh in your computer graphics course as well which is pretty fun subject to begin with. I thought I would talk about it, but uh, never mind. So yeah, uh, like focusing on these subjects will have definitely have you set up. Other than that, you can always explore on your own. But as for like just for like the fundamentals, like if you just focus on the math, and as well as you know have an understanding of what's like uh, understanding of in general algorithms plus systems, that will do the job for you to be honest. At least to start off. With. Right? Because then it uh, really like you'll be driving yourself into the, you know, going into more specifically because it's generally like uh, with data scientists comes a question of business context. You might have heard about it a lot of time. So what kind of field you're working on, what kind of data you're looking on, those contexts definitely helps. And you can sprinkle a little bit of your computer science understanding and yeah, you can have a good data science career, data science career start to begin with. Yeah, and yeah, don't fall for the uh, fall for those uh, job headings 
which you know ask for neural network and uh, n number of things that nobody is going to probably end up using right that's 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 a truth i mean i'm going to give you an honest answer here so today like since i'm currently going through my onboarding in my current company and we are working on recommendation systems in general so i actually asked about the kind of models we are using how we do modeling and these are these people are using tree models in places in critical places they are using tree models like simple tree models nothing fancy and that works that's doing the job that's just generating revenue so yeah like keep it simple keep your fundamentals strong and that will do the job i hope that thank answers you. that Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, any questions? Any other questions? I mean, like uh, we can take ten minutes for questions, so you guys can like, you know throw any questions you have. Like, be chill, man. Like, don't even think that okay, my question to Jalai Dam will It's fine. It's fine. Like, I mean, <laughs> I have asked ten more questions. Yeah, yeah. Huh, cool. Yes. Yeah. Good evening, Dada. Uh, so uh, in the intro, it was said that. You have done projects on uh, blo uh, blockchains and all, so this is kindly a new topic in AEC. Uh, and I don't have much context regarding those blockchains uh, technologies. So um, can you brief? Me? I have recently started uh, blockchain and uh, in computer networking and network security. So kindly, mm -hmm. can you guide me or give me a roadmap regarding the blockchain technology? see uh, i won't be the right person to give you a road map on blockchain technology because when i work right in first person 2000 late 2017 early 2018 and yeah throughout 18 mostly and 19 we are just working on the paper yes so compared to that now the ecosystem is more much more mature uh if you are someone who is looking for ethereum so again i'd say that jump into ethereum that's the most easiest one to get into get truffle get sticks i don't think truffle is a pretty old one these days i don't know what these uh, what the blockchain people are really using for development but yeah get the uh, get those things running but apart from that block the uh, for blockchain uh, you have to know few other things as well and those comes up in your uh, again fundamentals is that you need to understand uh, network like networking right distributed computing uh, pa some parts of it something like uh, uh, you can actually take a note of it that's called distributed consensus or decentralized consensus which is you know effectively what blockchain tries to solve in one way right almost every implementation is trying to solve this in some way right uh, so these things you'll have to know and as for like the development purpose as i said like take a deep dive into any of the uh, stack mm, like i like these days you have you also have polygon So, if you look into uh, you know, Polygon's uh, mm. job portal, like uh, the, their career page, you can actually get a very good glimpse in what kind of tech stack they use. So, this is actually uh, like an advice, a general advice for almost anyone uh, here, like looking for any question, like who are about to ask any questions around these kind of things. Is that uh, what tech stack they should pick, or what should they read, or what should they, uh, you know, they know should know about? Job uh, or career pages are really great for that. Just like look into the kind of role that you want and look into the kind of uh, uh, the tech stack they are using. That will give you a very good idea of like what you should be looking in. And once you like start googling them or just you know spend about a three or three hours in YouTube, you will already have sort of a vague idea what you should be learning. And as for roadmap, again as I said, like I don't have any particular roadmap for that, but you can actually uh, use these strategies. Beyond that, uh, like as a uh, like, if you want to get into like in general, what we call as a Web three, right? So that Web three will not always require you to write, uh, uh, sorry, uh, write smart contracts. Not always, right? So smart con knowing about smart contracts is another thing. You'll have to like deeply understand smart contracts. That's like if you are into smart contract development, then there is an aspect of what we call as the VM development. So. Uh, this is for you, Rohan. Like I hope you know that uh, Ethereum is actually a virtual machine, right? It executes your code. So uh, the Paul, like Polygon, uh, is a good example who are actually trying to work on uh, that VM aspect of things as well. So you can take that route as well. And for that, you don't uh, really have. You just have to know the fundamentals of blockchain, and then you can just uh, utilize your Golang or Rustlang uh, skills to actually work on the VM side of things. 
so again like uh, like that blockchain ecosystem has a lot of different roles for a lot of different people and you don't always have to work on the application layer because remember that smart contract is really the application layer so i was talking about the application development right so smart contract is really the application layer there. so yeah i hope that helps like again no roadmap but these are like the general advices i can give you like if you want to get get into the web three I hope that helps. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, anyone else? Any other questions? So, Dada, it's I have a question. Means it's a what little. It's not related to tech, but it's a more of a. Uh, you have been in the various roles and various fields you have explored in your means career choices and this things you have done. have been done many things i have seen your profile and all see i have seen that you have written the written papers and take a research side also then ultimately got to now you are in the means in a corporate job so means uh, how do you contrast the life in the field of research and in the job within in a corporate job basically uh yeah okay uh, as for rohan with how has been your experience in that means yeah so i mean, i cannot really comment on that research life because like uh, i was not really working as a like phd scholar mm -hmm. right? so like a phd scholar can actually comment on that much better mm -hmm. than me but uh, that the stark difference uh, one difference is that the you know the end objective is much different so in a corporate i mean say like corporate in general if you're working at some place which is paying you money because it's driving a value right it means that your work has to drive a value so for example if you are working as a front end engineer right and then you suddenly sit down and start researching that okay i want to make the next best uh, front end uh, <clears throat> ui framework better than react well, on company's time <laughs> like that's not going to be entertained at all right that, that, that that's just bonkers why would you do that the company has different metrics different objectives stick to those no there's that uh, when you're researching right it's fine if you actually kind of side track and look into other things as well because again like re general research happens on open ended things right the problem is open ended right and we honest his thing uh, my current role actually involves both of it so i'm going to work with the, like researchers who are actually already working here and then uh, gradually like kind of contribute in, in the, those sectors as well while uh, acting as a software engineer so it's kind of sort of a blend of both of these things and like even here right in corporate setting these people are actually trying to get and you know satisfy the matrix they like, go okay we want to drive the revenue we want to have better profitability we want to have better user engagement so how do i do that okay i'm going to uh, take bunch of uh, different models we're going to try them together we're going to run experiments that's it on a research setting things might look very similar the only difference is that your end goal is like yeah mujhe i want a paper published as for life like if you talk about phd it again depends on like your guide and your work style management i have a shitty uh, way of managing my work so yes like i have always been overburdened <laughs> and uh, the same thing in a company as well like it's it's not lot different but it's also not a uh, lot similar as well because the, the similarities comes in how you manage things right and how you manage yourself most of the time uh, the difference comes uh, from the you know the objectives in the general yeah and yeah that's how i would say it like i mean as i said like personally if you are doing a phd versus uh, you're doing a job which requires a lot of study you might not uh, see much difference but if you are doing a job where uh, you're not doing a lot of study and just writing bunch of code and you know you're getting a business requirement then it will be starkly different from what a phd might offer you and phd might also like a phd or general research might also be very boring for you because all you're doing is really studying so yeah i mean effectively you're just studying a lot you can do some kind of freelancing and like uh, you know build softwares as well but again you're not getting paid for that <laughs> so yeah broke and uh, studious at the same time in corporate you're not broke i mean yeah okay thank you dad oh, i hope yeah, that answers that got it dad but yeah if you do research and then join industry then you will not be broke <laughs> yeah yes researchers are paid pretty well by the way but uh, there's a hitch there as well is that if the company believes that research is not important 
yeah, your head will be cut off first. <laughs> Got it. Okay, uh, so I'll just quickly uh, conclude uh, from my end, then I'm open to more questions. Let me share my screen and just show the last bit, which I think would be very important for everyone, especially for the jobs. And this is specific, specifically for the jobs. All that we talked about, right, was uh, specifically about your CS fundamentals. And what you're looking at here, this uh, CICD, Docker, Google Cloud, right? You'll even later hear something called design patterns. Stuff like these, right, are, you know, uh, what do I say, not part of your fundamentals. They might not even use your fundamentals, but they are important because they are something that you have to actively know and work with. You know, it's like uh, um, uh, working with a computer, right? You're a computer science student. And you're saying that I don't know how to use a computer. It would be pretty difficult. It's learnable, but it would be difficult for you. So if you start a little bit early with these things, right? CI, CD, Google Cloud, and like Docker, and like all these concepts that come about when we talk about in general in software pipeline, it would really help you in the long term. Like, yeah, like for example, in your first interview, suppose right in your college placement, if they ask and you tell that, hey, I I've used CI CD to actually automate this thing. I was using Google Cloud to deploy my stuff. I was using Docker to make sure that um, all, all my team members didn't have to worry about the deployment section. And then you talk about that, hey, I use this design pattern because it makes sense and I architected the code in such a way that we can extend it later because we are planning for that. I mean, that's that's a sure impressor. Like if that if that doesn't impress anyone, like just, just leave that company, like interview somewhere else. <laughs> yeah, if that doesn't impress, just <laughs> interview somewhere else, to be honest. Because this is like as a fresher, if you bring this to the table, you're already way ahead of many, many people. Like you're way ahead of the competition, is what I'm saying. Right? So combine all this that we talked about, this all these uh, CS fundamentals with this, and you are you're you're rock solid, like uh, to start with, what I mean. Right? And yeah, uh, that's it. Like uh, that was the only like the what you call the missing bit. Nobody talks about them. Actually, I should have also included GitHub there because Git, GitHub and Git is one of the like most important uh, tool for a software engineer. So yeah, I should have included that. I don't know how I missed it, but yeah. And yeah, uh, all the best for your computer science journey, even for the non-CSC guys, because uh, end of the day, if you are in software, you will be exposed to computer science in one other way, and you might just end up liking the subject, who knows, or not, which is completely fine. Yeah, uh, that's it from my end. And I'm open to any questions. Yeah. And guys, please uh, ask questions, right? I mean, like, I know you guys might be thinking, hey, bhai, bhai hai, like, they know, so you know some shit and this or that. And like, what are we thinking? Should I be asking this question or not? Don't think that at all. Like, yeah. I mean, I'm giving my time. So like, why not make the best use of it? Right? Um, yeah. Um, Questions, guys. Very much. Uh, no questions. Oh. Okay. Uh, so it was great having you, Rajanda. Uh, if anybody else have a question do uh, share with us and we will ask Rajadda and like if he is considered enough he will reply you back. I'll, I'll so, just be considered enough man like what you <laughs> no of course you have a busy schedule <laughs> so anyway it was great uh, you came and gave insights about what actually happens inside a company so yeah we are now motivated to learn more on these concepts which you mentioned. Right. To start going for non csc programs, Hudson, pick up a language and start with hello world. That, that I mean, like that's the I mean I know the advice sounds dumb, right? But I don't really have much of there to you know contribute to that answer. Like yeah, just pick up a language, simple one, something like JavaScript or Python. That's fine if you do that. You don't have to go full, uh, you know, masochist hard by trying to pick up assembly or C. Like you can do that, but don't do that. That will probably hinder you. So yeah, just pick something simple like Python. 
follow a book maybe so i mean uh, i uh, like for python i can recommend you this uh, python the hard way it's by alan swart or something yeah python the hard way uh, python the hard way yeah you can take this book and yeah like i learned uh, python from this book in my class 11 yeah so yes i can vouch for this like i actually recommend this book a lot to a lot of people yeah, you can like you just start from somewhere is what I'll say. How many of you are actually like you know code here, or like are like are you guys not coding or just looking forward to start? Because I feel that somewhere like I did this like and I just you know uh, gave the entire talk a little bit way above than I should have. Yeah, sorry about that, brother. <laughs> Prash, you should have really told me about the demography a little bit earlier. Uh, actually, we expected some of the more senior guys to, but okay, okay. Got it. No, being I mean, not like, in the campus, it was actually hard to predict <laughs> the motive of the risk uh, agenda. Oh, no, 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 no. Actually, the problem is this happens a lot of times, so it becomes very really difficult. Like, I was uh, hoping that we have like people from all the different you know, years, and, and that's why I like, prepared it accordingly as well. That people from all the years and places can be. Uh, uh, yeah, I know, like that's why most people are quiet. I feel <laughs> they're like, "Why you can't tell me?" Yeah. 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 So I guess if we have no more questions, we can conclude. Like I mean, uh, if you guys have questions, you can post. But yeah, otherwise, I'm going to say. So then I guess it will be best that if we gain any questions, we'll forward it to you. Yeah, sure. Sure, that's fine. Okay. 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 Okay.